thinking hard about these questions, and I'd love to give you a, a chance to ask your questions as well. But um, let me just begin by asking you, Natalie, it's, it's almost mind-blowing to think about when you first landed there to where you are today. So what was the year you arrived there, and how there would you describe the difference in what you've seen? I got there in 2010, um, and you know, someone had been there before me in Peace Corps, and they had to be pulled out because of a coup. So when I arrived, it was a very adamant, you will start working right this minute, because we're <laughs> not going to lose this opportunity. So, uh -huh. so tell us between the, the moment, you arrived there in 2010? Mm -hmm. In 2010 when you arrived there, mm -hmm. and here we are, it's 2014. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the impact you've seen. Well, they continue to keep saying, you will keep finding an opportunity for us. <laughs> we, are, we are ready right now. So that ha their perseverance hasn't changed at all. Um, but I think because of the f financial benefit they've gotten out of um, participating in something like this, the change is, is profound. The impact is profound. Mm -hmm. um, because of the majority of the money going back to them minus the expenses that they incur here, they have sent all of their children officially from in um, just in January when we looked at a survey, they especially have sent all of their children to private schools. So none of them remain in public schools any longer. And 100% of their kids have been, been passed the national exam and are now in some of the best colleges that Madagascar has to offer. So that shows the, the sustainability of it. Um, they've, they've built better housing structures for themselves um, and they, they have access to health care. So I think those are the top ones. Yeah, that's huge. So before you, when you got there, did the government of Madagascar recognize this part, the silk weaving sector, and was it invested in in any way, or, um, and has that changed over time? When I arrived, I hadn't heard that the government had ever done anything supportive. I've, now that I've researched it for my thesis, I've, I've heard kind of in passing that they are interested in its potential. Um, they, they're quoted in a lot of ways suggesting that this is the answer for Madagascar. This had, this, because of the amount of silk that's available in Madagascar this, and the amount of people working in this sector, it could be so profound. But I have never heard of anyone at all participating or, or offering uh, grants or anything of that nature to, to make it move along. From 2010 until now, until I've never. Even though they, they talk about it more they because are, of They're their aware of, of what Sahalandi mm -hmm. has done. I know that to be true, mm -hmm. but they haven't helped in any. So how many members do you have now? There are 95 members, but the project uh, provides employment for 2,500 people 25. in three regions. Yeah. So Natalie, you started this when you were a Peace Corps volunteer, mm -hmm. and you were how old, 20? I was 23 when okay. I got to the Peace Corps. So, do you think this has been one of the biggest impacts of your life? Do you think this will be? Absolutely, I think it will be. Yeah. Probably will you the always impact of be my life. <laughs> working with them? Do you think? Or yeah, you yeah. I don't yeah. think I can escape it. I mean, I, I get text messages about their everyday life. So um, <laughs> from that until from them. Oh yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Um, uh -huh. As far as their everyday life to you know what the the latest news about the organization. Mm -hmm. um, ideas that they have for the future, so I don't think any of it's going going anywhere that's too fast. Right. No, that's great, we can yeah. see it in your eyes. So Shari, let me turn to you for a minute. Um, I think as I mentioned before, at the risk of, of uh, emphasizing Shari's and my age, you know, 30 years ago we were involved in the very, very beginning of work on employment and livelihood development, and, um, and most people didn't think that you could do business development at the bottom of the period and pyramid and with the poorest people in the world. And Shari's been working on that battle for her for her whole, her whole life, we've worked together on this area. So I want to ask you, Shari, now you run this major uh, foundation that is supporting very grassroots businesses in some of the poorest communities in the world. And I really want to know from your perspective, um, because I know you care about this a lot personally, but one of the biggest challenges the artisan sector faces is that people, for some reason, don't think it's real economic development. They don't think of it as a real driver of economic development, of revenue, of economic development, of jobs, or anything. And so this is one of our business biggest challenges. Um, what do you think about why that is the case? And why, when we look at a case like this and we see not only the employment and the income benefits, but the economic, and, but the savings, and the health benefits, and the educational benefits, why do you think it is that the artisan sector has a hard time explaining itself? Um, 
You know, it, it's it's interesting because um, you know Peggy and I were were discussing. You know, this this whole challenge of really helping to reframe how people think about trade and they think about economic development. And I think that part of the challenge um, is that m most people look at the United States and they look at what a job looks like here and they look at what the formal economy looks like and they make this sort of vast assumption that either one is desolate and totally poor and unable to feed yourself or you have the kind of economy that we have here in the United States. And in fact, as we see you know, such economic growth in Africa and you know, in many parts of the world, you're seeing multiple phases of economic development occurring all at the same time. So that it's not an either or. Um, in fact, one of my, the biggest thing that I deal with a lot is people keep talking about jobs. We need mm -hmm. trade so we can have SMEs because they create jobs. And, and that's true, but also when you recognize that the smallest producers themselves are producing goods and, and, and items that they can be trading in international markets, that in their perspective, from the perspective of the producer, they are making great economic strides. Now, um, some people will look at me and say, oh, I see these women and supposedly they're successful, but they still look poor to me. And that's because of the lens that we're bringing to it. And I think that when I think about inclusive economic growth, I think about economic growth where all producers get to participate. And as long as there are transparent terms of trade, producers at different levels and stages that can all participate in the value chain. And each, at each point, they will be creating economic value for themselves. And there's that, and then just one other little point in that people will say, well, this is such small amount of money. I mean, the, you talked about, I, f I forget the number, it was up there, the total amount that was uh, of sales from the, the, um, folk, mar the folk market 30, in, in Santa Fe. Yeah. And, and people will look at that and say, well, compared to billions, I mean, that's, you know, that's kind of chump change. But what we have to recognize is that when you aggregate that all and you build upon it, that it, it really does have the potential to spiral and have broader and broader economic benefits. Mm -hmm. So Shari, you know, I'm really reminded of um, when we were at the very beginning of the whole microfinance, microenterprise right. field. And most people said, a very, very poor person, that's not a viable business. And that right. person can certainly not accept, accept credit. Um, but then we saw how people came to see that the expression is living on less than a dollar a day and repayment rates were possible. Do you think it's possible to create a movement that recognizes artisan businesses in that same way. And um, I think we all know the limitations of the intention to microfinance, what it can and can't do. Do you think that in the work you do in Africa and, and listening to this kind of work, there's a way to have a similar movement? Um, I actually would like to believe very much so. And in some ways, it's not just a question for me, but it's a question for all of us here in the room. Um, because a lot of it has to do with us you know, reframing how we see the poor and economic opportunity. Um, and, and in a sense, the microfinance field did a beautiful job of somehow translating and making real human stories that allowed uh, different individuals to sort of latch on. And then, of course, you were dealing with such broad numbers that you began to see real dollars that, you know, in, in the size of transactions, you'd have microfinance institutions that might be lever you know, raising you know, $100 million, and then so suddenly this became, you know, the dollar amount went up, so this became a real business. But when you think about the billions of poor people in the world and recognize how much all of them are busily producing, and, and any of us who have visited the developing world know that people can be very poor, but it doesn't mean that they're not busily striving to earn a living and to benefit themselves and their families. So when you add all of that productive capacity together, it really does amount to the amount that can move the needle, move the needle from a national perspective, from a global perspective, as well as from the household perspective. Right, thanks. So let's turn to talking about the business itself. You know, the title of this event was called Scaling Up Artisan Businesses, the story of Sahalandi. And many of the Alliance members that are in the room and others, and um, Karen and Colvin, this huge challenge of very, very small artisan businesses that might have a few employees and that might have some sales, 
but never can really move to being more like a medium-sized business or an industry. Yet the Sahalandi story is a really interesting one to reflect on. So let's, let's turn to looking at it as a business model. It's been referred to, and Natalie, help us understand this, as a federation. Mm -hmm. um, one, is it a cooperative? And what's the business structure? And how did you really help to address the challenges of it as a viable business? And then you also mentioned how you're hoping to move it to a network of cooperatives, a federation mm -hmm. that's broader. So tell us about the business model um, and why you think you were able to scale up. Mm -hmm. So since 2007, it has been a federation. It was formed by the, the former president um, of the organization. It represents seven different cooperatives that have put themselves together as a federation. Um, and that's where you get the, the 95 members of Saalandi, but the vast more amount of actual people employed by, by the organization. Um, and it, but yet, Saalandi is still a very small case for the, for the whole country of Madagascar because thousands of people work on silk work. Um, it's, silk is known, raw silk is known to be the cultural identity of the country. So there are far more people to talk about um, than Saalandi working in this, in this arena, but yet there's little to no opportunity for them at all. I think uh, Saalandi is probably one of maybe three organizations that has actually ever sold their work abroad, wow. and I think, honestly, the other two might have been from a suitcase, um, mm -hmm. and ours <laughs> were from an actual export after the suitcase happened. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but it, you know, it's, it, it wasn't hard to convince them that they had something to scale up. Because when you have sales like that in two days, it doesn't take much convincing. So they, it really just required a lot of on-the-ground leadership, which is what we were talking about before, for them to, to say, I'm, you know, I'm just sitting in the back seat saying, what do you guys want to do about this? And they're like, we have to keep going. And we should connect more with other cooperatives in the area that also want to do this. And you know, they should be the ones owning the cooperative. They should be the ones making the decisions and right. continuing it, it so forward. So what kind of capacity building support did they need and do they still need? That's, yeah, that's a very interesting question. I think, honestly, Peace Corps provided, at least me and every other Peace Corps volunteer, with the means to, to implement a lot of that. A lot of it was financial management. Mm -hmm. um, costing and pricing was an anom anomaly, complete anomaly for them. Um, but after earning that much money, they needed to know how to save it and how much they needed to have for their house, household every month and how much to have for their business. That was a huge, huge part. The various management techni techniques were very important, um, ways to get people to be more efficient without you know, sweeping them out altogether. Um, but I think that they're in, still in need of more access to credit, honestly. Um, they know how to function with it, but it's not available in the country really for women at all. So a more access to grants, um, just more leadership, I think, mm -hmm. and, and possibly some gender uh, trainings, just ways for, ways for their households to be able to understand this change, mm -hmm. because it is quite profound for the husband and wife dynamic mm -hmm. to, to be able to say, oh, okay, yes. now my wife earns yeah. far more than <coughs> I do. Does, uh, does Sahalandi um, offer credit to its members now? Did, we we they, haven't ever but they need it. done anything like mm -hmm. that. Honestly, I don't think the business itself has the means to do that. Yeah. But they they mm -hmm. trade cocoons. Uh, that's their their method of credit, if you will, um, yeah. at the moment. If if somebody has an order, they'll they'll work right. with each other right. in that way. So, Shari, let me turn to you and ask you to be the skeptic. You know, you've spent more than thirty years working on small de business development in, in in the developing world. You know a lot about cooperatives. You work in Africa now on this. Um, and I think one of the first things you said to me when I mentioned about this work with the Alliance, you're like, it's really tough you know, to scale up this artisan sector. What are your thoughts about um, what the challenges are and what the Sahalandi case teaches us and what you're personally reflecting on in your own work in this way? Yeah, um, yeah actually, when Peggy first talked about the Alliance, I did immediately jump to all of the challenges. Um, how many websites have there been that have kind of been the, next, the, the greatest new thing that was going to connect artisans with markets and those websites have come and gone? How many alternative marketing organizations that have been around over the last 30, 40 years have come and gone or just sort of you know, continue on in a very you know, small level? And um, what I 
think is um, particularly important is, uh, it really can be summed up in, in two words that are not you know, terribly specific to crafts, and it's, it's the words value chains. Um, that we need to begin to understand the craft products and understand how they link ultimately to markets, how they need access to you know, the capital and inputs and access to quality controls and standards. And, and rather than it being driven by you know, assuming that the craft person knows what the market wants, mm -hmm. really starting to understand much more broadly how these craft materials can in fact be used and incorporated into wide ranges of products that you know, American consumers are interested in buying. And so, and then as part of that value chain, typically value chains have embedded within them different kinds of financial services that are needed and different sort of awareness of, of, of different sort of market and market requirements. So rather than thinking at, as we look at these beautiful scarves, well, how many scarves do people actually need? And, um, you know, for example, we have my institution, the U.S. African Development Foundation, works with um, artisan cooperatives in a number of countries in Africa, and, and we'll be talking to them, they might be local weavers, we'll be talking to them about, you know, weaving draperies and furniture coverings and thinking about whole other kinds of markets as opposed to the market for the finished goods. So it's, it's really beginning to recognize that these producers are just part of a larger value chain, and that changes the whole perspective so that the producer doesn't have to think that they themselves are going to you know, carry all the way across, mm -hmm. but that they're actually um, to the consumer, um, but they will be able to um, you know, tie in to different sales and distribution, and, great. and, and there we are. No, yeah. that's great. Thank you. That wasn't a skeptical answer, but I've no. heard it <laughs> before. Um, I, I'm going to turn it to the audience so we can participate in this conversation, but I just I, I want to make sure that um, I've touched on this, uh, both to Shari and, and, and Natalie. Um, here we are in Washington, and the Alliance has an opportunity to really make a strong, strong, strong case for more investment and more support, capacity building, connections to market within the um, artisan sector than before. If you could ma wave, wave a magic wand, Natalie, and um, what would you be asking for and what can some of the people in this room and others in Washington do to support organizations like Sahalandi? If you really had a magic wand, you're handing it to you right now. <laughs> to be totally honest with you, I think that Peace Corps provides a really good way of, of implementing some of these trainings mm -hmm. in that it doesn't require any, uh, any, any salary for, for mm -hmm. the volunteer, but it provides a really good on the, ra on the ground um, way of teaching the capacity building that needs to be taught. So if I had my magic wand, I would make a, an artisan sector in the Peace Corps. An artisan sector, <laughs> that's a great one. Yeah. Great. I think you could run it. Um, Shari, you spend a lot of time arguing for resources on the Hill and with others and trying to argue for supporting African businesses. If, if I handed you the magic wand, what would you say um, to the people in this room and to others if you could? Well, actually, US, the US African Development Foundation that I, I now lead has a really wonderful model where we work with local technical partners. So while Peace Corps is important, to me it's really important that it's really more in African, I, we work exclusively in Africa, but it would be true for any region, that it's really individuals and communities, and we actually work with local technical advisors that are consulting firms or NGOs that are actually training and working with the grantees. And, so that you're building up that local capacity to be able to scale up. And, um, and I actually think that some of the work that's been done in trade capacity building, such as even the trade hubs, um, you know, if the trade hubs really understood, as um, U the US government has supported trade hubs for both West Africa and East Africa, and if they understood that their mandate was specifically to work with mm -hmm. the artisan sector and to help facilitate those market links and that means facilitate you know, um, uh, access to brokers and middlemen and you know, buyers and department stores. And it's, it's really a whole market network that needs to be further supported. And of course, we need to make sure that the terms of trade 
are such that the artisans actually earn their fair share of what's taking place. Oh, exactly. Um, let me turn to the audience. Let me start. Um, I forgot when I was mentioning the Alliance members are here to recognize that Joan Schifrin of Global Goods is here. She is one of our founding members. So I'm going to turn to you, Joan. Sorry to call you. Um, to Global Goods is one of uh, wonderful artisan support organizations that has been in the business for some time addressing these very challenges. Would you like to uh, start with our first question for the? I think we have a microphone right here. Thanks for now. Um, really a question about um, sort of outside of, of the business per se, but um, about the sustainability. And I was wondering two things. One about the environmental. It sounds pretty um, um, dire with 90% yeah. of the, there's defore of deforestation and, and just how you get around that or what's being done at any level, whether it's NGOs or the government. Um, and also about whether um, young women are seeing um, the organization as one that they want to participate in and that they see that as a, a career and a, um, for them. Yeah, great question. Let's take a couple of questions and then if you guys could. Um, are there other? Yes, please. Will you tell us who you are and your organization? Um, oh, thank you. Uh, I had a question. Um, I would love for you, as candidly as you would be willing to be, to talk <laughs> about how catalytic your role was in scaling the business mm -hmm. and how important having essentially a Western market champion is for some of these organizations in sort of reaching specifically a Western market. Awesome questions. Let's, let's turn to you guys to respond. Do um, you want to start? Sure. Okay. I can start with yeah. Jones. Um, first off, about the deforestation, I do think it's a, it's a dire problem, but because of that forest being owned by the government, it really has to be an approach that includes, includes them. So um, they need to be more helpful in providing the means to, to fix that problem because it's a nationwide problem. It's certainly not just um, the particular tree that's, that is used to make silk uh, that's been deforested, but it's all over. And the, the second question, um, young women being, being involved, and yeah, I think that they, they absolutely consider this to be their, their job. Um, I actually asked them that uh, as part of my thesis um, research when I was there, and they, they said that it's a drastic change. They, it used to be just occasional work, and now it is something that, that they do every single day, and they consider it to be their full-time the 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 people who are involved in it now their children because of the of the opportunity that they've seen they they might be going to get their their degrees or have have an opportunity like that but they they have come back um, to, to be part of the organization Natalie, maybe you can address the question um, about you personally, as, as candidly as possible. Yeah, uh, to be perfectly honest, I think it probably was was quite important that I uh, was a part of it. I think that's why I mentioned the possibility of Peace Corps um, being more involved in these kinds of organizations because they they were hopeless when I when I got there. They really had no their. I, I explained it in a way at different time that they're. I mean they're. Their heads were hung down when I first met them because they didn't really, they, they didn't think that they had anything coming to them. They told me to start working, but they weren't, they didn't actually think that it was going to happen. So until I found Santa Fe and had the acceptance letter in front of them, they started to be much more engaged with their work and aware that something could happen. So I think it, it has to be on the ground capacity building, but hopeful hopefully one that has access to, to the international market. Let me um, turn to Char, but let me first say hello. Um, Tony, I'm glad you're here. Tony Carroll's just joined us from Manchester Trade. Tony's been working on the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act for, for years. Thanks, Tony, for being Thanks with us over the years. You missed an amazingly moving film and conversation about a great <laughs> yeah, business. Um, and I'm glad that you're here, Cher. You may talk about AGOA. But let's turn to you. Um, yeah, I actually am going to play devil's advocate a bit because. Um, Please do. And I think the work that you've been doing is absolutely wonderful. So, and I, it's not intended to be in any way to, dis, to diminish 
the personal commitment that you've made and the contribution that you're making. But I also believe that if we want to see something like this be much broader and much more sustainable, that there is a role. And, mm -hmm. and USADF, our, our mandate is, is really to support Africans and African enterprises, African organizations. And so we are looking at African SMEs uh, in some instances that are serving some of the kinds of functions that, that you have done. And because they are a commercial ongoing enterprise, they're doing it over the long haul. They're doing it for 10 years. They're doing it for 20 years. And um, they're bringing a certain kind of commercial discipline and access to finance and a longer term perspective that I think is, is really very, very valuable. Um, so while I think the role of volunteers who come for a few years is, 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 is very wonderful, and I think you're certainly a very special individual who's made a great co uh, commitment so it's more than just a couple of years as a Peace Corps volunteer. Um, but we find that often Peace Corps volunteers might start something, but in the long run it does become important that the local population really embrace it and take a bit more of a hard-nosed approach about how do we grow this as a business and what really do we need. And once again, uh, a much uh, more multi multifaceted notion of the kinds of products, the kinds of markets, Mm -hmm. and, and, and so sort of building on what you've mm -hmm. been doing and seeing how far it can go. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, there's a question right here. Please tell us your name and your organization. Um, I'm Megan McDonald. I manage Sasa Designs by the Deaf. And it's, it's more of comments, I guess, and questions. But I just, um, I sort of want to share that I think it is significant, the participation of um, a Western influence from a sales and marketing standpoint. I did my graduate research on how to eliminate the middleman mm -hmm. and went in wanting to eliminate the middleman yeah. and found it, it was absolutely impossible to do that and totally counterproductive. Mm -hmm. um, but our model, I spent two years working on the ground with our artisans building capacity and now our workshop is fully managed by our Kenyan staff. Um, and we only have one hearing staff person. Um, so it's, it's all of our deaf artisans who are managing themselves, managing production. Um, so the long-term goal is certainly to be locally run and organized, but the, we do 90% of our sales in the US. We're doing far more sales than we thought in Kenya, and we, we happen to be in an area where we have a growing middle class um, and a huge international presence, so we have that option. But to, to think that we could eliminate um, the American involvement, since we happen to be based in America, would be unrealistic. And on that note, how do we support that involvement? It's not realistic to support it with volunteers. Um, unless you have a major church or network behind an organization, it's simply the sophistication of these tiny cottage industries <laughs> is such that you actually need some serious manpower. And that has been one of the biggest challenges. It's taken us two yeah. years to get where we are. We produce over 1,000 pieces a month. We've got 50 to 70 wholesale partners at any given time. Um, but we have to sustain both our Kenyan and our US staff. And I, one thing I just wanted to put out in the room, um, we're a nonprofit. A lot of the money available right now is for for-profits. And that's something for people to think about, how to balance the funding and, and who it's available to and the structure because we're ineligible for a lot even though we're running on sustainable business practices. Um, something to think about. No, that's great and congratulations on your work. Um, let me just, because I know that Shari has to run to Dallas to get on a plane to Africa. Tony, would you just stand up for one minute? I want to take this opportunity. Sorry, it's only because I know you that I know you're not going to be mad at me for doing this. Um, just as it relates to the question of AGOA, African Growth and Opportunity Act, and artisan and business sector, particularly because we had a pre-meeting with Shari's organization and the State Department around whether AGOA can be made to support businesses like Sahalandi and others. Do you want to comment at all on the hopes for AGOA moving well, here? Well, I'll, I'll mention three things. Mm -hmm. um, firstly, AGOA, as we all know, has to be renewed. Uh, in this or certainly at the last moment the next Congress. Uh, otherwise, the benefits of a goal will expire. USTR Michael Froman uh, has made a very ambitious statement about his hopes for a goal renewal that will be ambitious beyond just <coughs> market preferences to include a whole suite, if you would, of market support uh, uh, interventions and mechanisms that could include financing and institutional support as we've discussed. I know Sherry's been in involved in this debate. Um, so I would urge all of you to, to you know, try to get involved and engaged with members of Congress, 
and State Department officials, USDR and whomever, to try to get some momentum behind a GOA. Because as you know, in Congress right now, there's not a lot of ambition for almost anything. And uh, unfortunately, we get sort of caught in that vice because there's very little opposition to a go. We know it's just getting legislative space from leadership to get on the calendar. Item number two is um, Madagascar was especially hurt by the removal of uh, Madagascar from AGOA preferences. Uh, this was because there was a uh, decision, as you know, AGOA requires a certain amount of, of, of uh, conformance with standards under AGOA. Because there was a, a government, a change of government, and an extra constitutional change of government, mm -hmm. Madagascar was taken off AGOA of preferences. Unfortunately, that immediately put 30,000 women out of work. Mm. Um, as an investor and as a business person, I don't want to have my investment governed by people in the State Department determining on a year-to-year -year basis what the political currency of the day is. So I think there should be a permanence to these investments. And then lastly, I think there's a great opportunity for the leadership, Af U.S. Africa Leadership Summit, which is coming in August here in D.C., to showcase not only blue jeans and khakis, but really creative African designs. And I'm hoping that in the course of that three-day summit of 50 in Africa leaders, we'll be able to find space in that program to showcase this type of product, right. along with many of the other great fashion items. Because I don't think Africa should be caught in a race to the bottom mm -hmm. with Bangladesh and Cambodia and who can produce the cheapest no, uh, amount, uh, cheapest 432s, which are standard commodity clothing. They really need to be launched into what is the creative space that Africa can compete above and beyond anybody else, anywhere else. Right. So this is an example of Africa's competitiveness in design. And I hope, that, and, and all of you who have any access to the State Department or the White House on the planning of this agenda, hope that you'll make them know Let's do something that really resonates with African fashion. And the First Lady, of course, would be perfect in that spot because she's already been committed and interested in African That's design. Right. No Sorry for taking no, up all that space. No, perfect. No, okay. Um, I want to uh, bring the panel to a close and invite Natika Washington of, of the Department of State. But before I leave, I really want to give a round of applause to Shari Nepstensi and Natalie. Um, you know, I think I, I think I speak for everyone, Natalie, to say um, your story is really, really inspirational. I also want to, David, ask you to stand up one more time because that film is so incredibly beautiful. It tells a great story. So thank you so much. And uh, Natika Washington of the State Department will uh, provide us some remarks, and then I think we'll have a detail with us. We will. Great. Thank you. Is this on? Can you guys hear me? I'm pretty loud anyway. Um, well, first of all, we just want to thank the Aspen Institute for hosting this uh, fabulous panel discussion. Obviously, we want to thank Peggy for being an absolute, uh, absolute great uh, moderator, and Natalie and Char and all of you guys for coming to participate in this discussion. We really appreciate it, but more importantly, we really are excited that we're getting the news out about this great um, collaboration made up of you know, governments and, and, and artisan support groups and private sector coming together trying to artisans to try to tackle many of the issues that so many artisans are facing around the world. Um, we also want to thank, obviously, our great fellows, Henna and Natalie. They're running around here. They're great. We are very excited to have them on board. <laughs> She's back there. She's like, I don't want to stand anymore. <laughs> Um, so, but anyway, as you can see, there's a lot of imperative, uh, challenging issues that um, artisans face for scaling up their businesses. Um, but the impact and the challenges, many of which were discussed today, today, here today, were great. Uh, obviously, Sahalandi's uh, story is a uh, is a great story. It was a great presentation that we saw, and many of the things that um, this cooperative went through, the challenges, how they overcame them, how they found access to a lot of different opportunities, can be uh, used, uh, you know, in, in different cooperatives around the world. We can take these best practices and try to figure out if we can, you know, use some of those best practices and kind of replicate them all over. Um, so it was really exciting to get an opportunity to see those stories. I was really excited to see that you know the kids are going to school the the mothers are getting the grandmothers are getting health uh, health care needs you know women in, are being empowered and girls are being empowered and um, jobs are being created in communities all over um, the the in, in Madagascar within these this network so it's really been exciting to be able to have an opportunity to, sh to showcase the great work that you're doing again so I just want to give you another round of applause <laughs> Um, 
So the, um, the artisan sector is a very powerful and growing sector, and the alliance, uh, through its members, is uh, dr trying to drive a, a, a much-needed change in this sector. Um, the alliance will continue to host roundtable discussions like this in D.C., around the world, in the pilot countries that we're going to be um, implementing new programs and activities based on some of the, the barriers that we've collectively come together and targeted. So I would just encourage many of you all who are interested in learning more about the alliance and the work that we're doing that you stay linked in here internally with our uh, secretariat. We, uh, pay attention to our website. You know, um, please reach out to any of the contacts that we have here if you want to learn more um, about the work that we're doing, the, any upcoming events, any of our, our upcoming markets or discussions. Just please continue to be linked in um, here within, with Aspen and the Alliance uh, Secretariat. Um, we also would like to uh, kind of give a, a, a sort of a call to action for those of you that are interested in uh, learning um, how to become a member of the Alliance. We would ask that you, uh, you know, find one of us here. There's many of the original members, but most importantly, um, the fellows that we mentioned earlier and Peggy can um, give you more details on how to become a member, what that membership uh, would look like, opportunities for you to just, you know, if you just want opportunities just, just to learn more about um, what, what we're doing, they can keep you linked into that as well and then also if you know of any specific challenges that you're facing internally within your organizations within your businesses that, uh, from working with artisans that we didn't mention here today please feel free to have a conversation with any of us um, if you want to uh, kind of give us in input on those different challenges we like to hear that we want to bring the you know bring those challenges together and make sure that we are all collectively uh, tackling those uh, uh, those challenges internally as members of the alliance um, and then also uh, we just want to let you know that there's a reception following uh, this this great panel discussion today and we hope that many of you all can stay on there'll be wine there will be appetizers I believe so please uh, enjoy the the festivities afterwards if you have any questions or concerns um, or anything like that please uh, let us know and once again thank you and we hope you enjoy today's event thanks